Father in heaven, we cannot begin our study without your help. Enlighten our minds and help us to learn the lessons you want us to learn. In Jesus' name, Amen. Welcome to the greatest miracle in the history of mankind. What does the Bible and archaeology say about the Exodus? 14.9 Exodus, so the Egyptians pursued them. All the horses, and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihahirot, before Baal Zephon. It would have taken him at least two days to do so. The approximate time required by the Israelites to travel across the desert from Etham. The destruction of mankind gives the following account. Let's read it. And when the earth became light again, and the morning had dawned, the army men came forth with their bows and their weapons, and they set their arms in motion to shoot the enemies. The account continues. Heading east from the eastern delta into the desert, the Egyptian army did not succeed in killing the fleeing people. The Pharaoh tried in vain to destroy the people, but failed. What was east of the eastern delta? The destruction of mankind mentions this, but where is it? The Red Sea. There you've got the sketch. What route did the Egyptians take to get to the Red Sea? The Tumilat Canal was possibly restored during the 12th dynasty and was seemingly navigable during the reigns of Hatshepsut and Thutmoses III, and this is the time of the Exodus, who made intensive use of their navy for both economic and military ventures. So the Egyptians pursued them. First going to give the biblical one and then the one from Josephus. All the horses, all the horses. I don't know how many horses were left. And chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihahirot before Baal Zephon. What does Josephus tell us about the strength of the Egyptian army? He says, now when the Egyptians had overtaken the Hebrews, they prepared to fight them, and by their multitude they drove them into a narrow place, for the number that pursued after them was 600 chariots, like the Bible says, with 50,000 horsemen, and 200,000 footmen, all armed. Interesting the additional information. The greatest army of the ancient world was approaching the weakest nation of the world. And this is going to be repeated at the end of time. But the greatest display of military strength was also heading for a total disaster, eschatology. The weakest slave nation was heading for the greatest display of the redemptive power of the great God, Yahweh. It is possible to like, is it possible to locate the place where Israel passed through? What does the Bible call the place? Pihahirot. In our previous lecture, we noticed that the encyclopedia mentions the site to be just below the Suez Canal, uh, but it does not identify the exact spot, the encyclopedia. Let's ask Fluffius Josephus to tell us his account. Could this be Pihahirot? They also seized 
on the passages by which they imagined the Hebrews might flee, shutting them up between inaccessible precipices and the sea. Now you take Google Earth, you'll only find one place, find one place where the mountains and the sea meet. Do you think this mountain and sea match the description of Josephus? This is the only mountain, the only place on the entire coastline where sea and mountain meet. It is so logical. Could this be the Hahirot where they camped? On this sketch you see a, a red dot pointing to Pi Hahirot. I think this researcher did a great job. For there was mountains that terminated at the sea. This is Josephus. Which were impossible by reason of their roughness and obstructed their flight. Wherefore they, they pressed upon the Hebrews with their army where the mountains were closed with the sea. From the air you get a, a very clear picture of the, the battleground. There you've got the mountains and then a great valley battleground. Verse 10 says, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. I like this. Here's the problem. Let's pray to God about the problem. Reaction in this life and death crisis, crisis and crises, Go to God. The more pious among the Israelites cry to God. The irreligious murmured against Moses. While visiting the site, I was thinking of a statement from one of the best commentaries on the book of Exodus. Patriarchs and Prophets. Pharaoh collected his forces, 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt, 600 plus all the chariots. Horsemen, captains, on foot soldiers, Josephus says 200,000. The king himself, attended by the great men of his realm, headed the attacking army to secure the favor of the gods and thus ensure the success of the undertaking. The priests also accompanied them. Who joined forces in order to annihilate God's people? Church and state. What event preceded this death decree? It was a Sabbath issue. Exodus 5.5 5. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and ye make them rest. You allow them to worship on the Sabbath. Rest from their burdens. They've lost the beauty of the Sabbath, and Moses restored this. And when he did this, Pharaoh was very upset. He wanted a seven-day week, working week. But the Lord said to Moses, Let them go back and worship me on my Sabbath. How did Pharaoh treat the Sabbath observers? Severe persecution. This is going to be repeated. How did God react to the persecutors of his Sabbath observing people? And it's going to be repeated. Ten plagues. Do you, do you hear the penny falling? Eschatology, typology, and then the sequence of the end time events. Moses had shown his people that obedience to God was the first condition of deliverance. Did you get the thought? 
and the efforts made to restore the observance of the Sabbath had come to the notice of their oppressors. The king was resolved to intimidate the Israelites by a grand display of power. The Egyptians feared lest their forced submission to the God of Israel should subject them to the derision of other nations. Pride. But if they should now go forth with a great show of power and bring back the fugitives, they were to redeem their glory as well as recover the services of their bondmen. Now for the site where they crossed the Red Sea. The Hebrews were encamped beside the sea whose waters presented a seemingly impassable barrier before them, while on the south a rugged mountain obstructed their further progress. Can you see the mountain protruding into the sea? The Egyptian government made a road coming round here. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. They were in a state of shock. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. These are the pious ones. Suddenly, they beheld in the distance the flashing armor of moving chariots, betokening the advance guard of a great army. As the force drew nearer, the hosts of Egypt were seen in full pursuit. Hmm. To human eyes, their plight appeared hopeless. Shut in on the east by the sea, on the south by the rugged mountain, and on the west by mountainous deserts, and to the north by the pursuing Egyptians, they probably concluded that escape was impossible. Furthermore, they were unarmed and unprepared for battle. Finally, they had not yet learned to place their trust in the power and protection of God. If you have accepted God as your provider, trust Him even when circumstances seem unfavorable. This is a way to develop trust and faith in God and be happy. He wants to reveal his protecting love and save us from destruction by our enemies. Are you blaming someone for the circumstances of the moment, like Adam and Eve? Has God perhaps allowed it for a purpose? It's not always the devil or somebody else. At times, God leads us into these difficult situations. Let's trust him. Verse 12. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? Now, this is, I believe, the mixed multitude. Saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. This is a form of hysteria. Josephus says they were ready to stone their leader Moses. Poor Moses. The children of Israel were joyful to receive the tidings of their freedom and made haste to leave the scene of their bondage. But the way was toilsome and at length their courage failed. Their journey led them over barren hills and desolate plains. The third night they found themselves walled in on each side by mountain ranges. While the Red Sea lay before them, they were perplexed and greatly deplored their condition. They blamed Moses for conducting them to this place for they believed they had taken the wrong course. Do you blame God at times for your situation? This surely, said they, is not the way to the wilderness of Sinai, nor to the land of Canaan promised to our fathers. 
we can go no farther, but must now advance into the waters of the Red Sea or turn back toward Egypt. How powerless they felt before that mighty foe, the wailing of the terror-stricken women and children mingled with the lowing of the frightened cattle and the bleating of the sheep added to the dismal confusion of the situation. What was Moses going, was Moses going to give up and say, sorry, I can't handle this situation any longer? Shout at the people, blame God. What was Moses going to do? Having been brought into this position in obedience to the divine direction, Moses felt no fear of the consequences. If you do what is right, do not fear the consequences. Are you obeying God? I'm sure you are. Then please allow him to take care of the consequences that you're experiencing. Verse 13, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Now, for the, for the Egyptians you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Eschatology. But now as the Egyptian host approached them, Expecting to make them an easy prey, the cloudy column rose majestically into the heavens, passed over the Israelites, and descended between them and the armies of Egypt. A wall of darkness interposed between the pursued and the pursuers. How did it affect the Egyptians? The Egyptians could no longer discern the camp of the Hebrews and were forced to halt because of the cloud. But as the darkness of the night deepened, the wall of cloud became a great light to the Hebrews, flooding the entire encampment with the radiance of day. The Egyptians couldn't see this. What exactly was the purpose of the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night? Jesus stood at the head of that vast army. The cloudy column by day and the pillar of fire by night represented their divine leader. The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. There was no way in which the Israelite slaves could fight the mighty Egyptian army. There is no way in which poor slaves of sin can fight the enemy of evil. What happened to the mighty Egyptian army when they caught up with their enemies? All night long sounded the tamping of the hosts of Israel crossing the Red Sea all night long. But the cloud hid them from the sight of their enemies. The Egyptians, weary with their hasty march, had encamped upon the shore for the night. They saw the Hebrews only a short distance before them, and as there seemed no possibility of escape, they decided to take a night's rest and make an easy capture in the morning. The night was intensely dark. The clouds seemed to encompass them like some tangible substance. Deep sleep fell upon the camp. Even the sentinels slumbered at their posts. Verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Moses, tell them to go forward. The Israelites were not to remain completely inactive while the Lord brought about their deliverance. 
they were to move forward. And as they did so, to witness the mighty power of God. Let's move forward. Don't become inactive in a crisis situation. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. You know, for a short minute, I relived the moment of the greatest display of God's power. I took this white object and I thought back of Moses. When he hit this water, the same body of water, there was a huge noise and the water parted. Did God need the assistance of Moses to make a highway through the Red Sea? No. Was there magical power in his rod? No. God again chose to work through Moses in order that the people might come to trust more fully in their appointed leader. He ever operates in accordance with the principles of utilizing consecrated human agencies to accomplish his work on earth whenever and wherever possible. God wants to use you. 17 and 18. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind. The angel of God, Jesus Christ, and the column by day and the column of fire by night. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one and it gave light by night to the other so that the one did not come near the other all that night. The night drew on quickly, intensifying the impenetrable wall of darkness provided by the cloud. Meanwhile, on the side facing the Israelites, the pillar presented the appearance of a brilliant torch lighting up the whole camp and making it as easy to prepare for the march as it would have been by day. In that dark night, God made it light. And he wants to make it light and bright in your darkest hour, my friend. Thus the flocks could be gathered, the beasts of burden collected and laid it, and the various tribes and families arranged in marching order. They awaited only the signal to start. Can you see that vast two million people crowd? Next time we're going to learn more about the greatest act of delivery in the history of mankind, the Exodus. This mighty act of salvation is so important that he built his holy law on this foundation. Here you have it. Exodus 20 verse 1, the first verse of the Ten Commandments. And God spake all these words, saying, I'm the Lord your God. And by the way, these mountains trembled when he spoke. I am the Lord your God, and they could feel his power, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This was the first thing they had to remember 
before reading the next section, the Ten Commandments. And before you read the Ten Commandments, just meditate for a moment on God's unmerited grace. God's unmerited grace and redemption. And then you continue reading the Ten Commandments. Are you trapped in the sin of dishonesty, telling lies, taking things, things that do not belong to you? The God who revealed his power and delivered two million people from slavery and destroyed the greatest military force of the day can deliver you from thou shalt not steal. Don't look at the commandment in isolation. Look at the first verse. He's a God that can deliver. Are you a bitter person? Are you hating someone? Are you killing people in your thoughts? Are you struggling in vain to find peace of mind in this bondage of negative emotions? Before God said, you shall not murder, he said, I delivered an entire nation of slaves from bondage. May I assist you, may I assist you and deliver you from the bondage of hatred. Are you in the pleasant or unpleasant clutches of an extramarital affair? The sin of our day, pornography, whatever. I have very good news for you, my dear friend. The God who said you shall not commit adultery also said, I've delivered not one, but two million people from bondage. I have the power to deliver you from the strong bonds of unfaithfulness as well. Read the Ten Commandments in the light of the first verse. He's a redeeming God. God's requirements for you and me to live holy lives, lives are built on the true story of the Exodus. He is a God who can save. Don't let the devil tell you it's impossible. Neither your wife, or your husband, or anybody else. If you allow God, you'll experience deliverance. Father in heaven, thank you for being such a loving God. Thank you for delivering people, slaves who do not deserve it. Please, rescue us from the clutches of the enemy. In Jesus' name, Amen. 